Welcome, guys, to the Couple of Nurses podcast with your hosts, Peter Fendero and myself, Matt Slarczyk. This is a podcast where we tackle current health news and hot nursing topics, one conversation at a time. Everyone, thank you for listening, subscribing. We really appreciate you. And if you have no idea how much it means to us, if you smash the five star, we get viewed a lot more, we grow, and this helps us keep producing the high quality content that we do. Happy New Year to everyone out there. It's a great year, 2021. Let's do this. Everyone out there on their goals, their purpose, doing whatever, nursing school, right? Mm -hmm. How are we doing today, Pete? I'm doing great. We have an amazing guest on today, a returning guest. Her name is Alexandra Zubek. She is currently in a clinical psychology counseling internship. And this episode, we're going to discuss mental health, self-care, depression, burnout during these tough COVID ongoing times. So what's up, Alex? How you doing? Hi, I'm doing pretty good. Today was a very accomplished, um, long, but fun day. Mm -hmm. Very productive. Yes. A lot of energy expelled already. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, we're burnt out ourselves right now from all this hiking. So let's get right into it. What would you say about burnout that is stand out, stands out to you the most? So I think a lot of people in the field, any field, whether it's nursing, whether you're an oncologist, whether you're a PA, um, a lot of people are experiencing burnout right now, and I think it's important to realize that burnout is something that can affect you no matter how long you've been in the field, no matter how long you've been practicing or doing what it is that you're doing, and it's important to learn to know where your limits are and where to set boundaries so that you can have enough in your cup for yourself. Mm, smooth. So in your field, do you get a lot of people that come in for burnout? That or they might be experiencing burnout, they them, or they themselves might not understand what burnout is, or they're not going, they don't know that they're going through it. Yeah, so we actually have a lot of people who are experiencing like high stress, um, a lot of anxiety, depression. Um, sometimes they are experiencing so much stress that it's paralyzing to them, and it's presenting as depression because they're so overwhelmed and they're dealing with so much that um, they don't even know themselves that like the 40 plus hours extra that they're putting in at work every two weeks, they think, oh, it's good money, it's overtime, but it's actually crushing them and it's hard for them to see that. So how do you promote them stepping back from that work environment and having more of like a work-life balance? So I like to ask my patients, what is one good thing that you've done or plan on doing for yourself today? Okay. Mm -hmm. And that comes with a lot of like stigma as in, oh, well, if I'm doing it for myself, then I might be selfish or maybe I don't deserve to do this one thing for myself. But you can't be there for anybody else unless you yourself are a whole person. Just like on an airplane, you have the masks that come down. If the cabin pressure drops, they always say to put your mask on first and get oxygen for yourself first because if you can't help yourself, you die. <laughs> then you can't help the next person you know, next to you. You're both gonna die. That's so smart. yeah. I think one thing too is you say you have to do first do it for yourself and that's the same thing with burnout. How are people going to go to you? They first have to learn how to self-diagnose that. So like, what are like the hallmark signs that maybe people like see that they should maybe should or how would you kind of first like self-diagnose yourself? Like just say and be like, hey, I think I need a break. I'm burning mm -hmm. out. Like how do you catch yourself doing it? So imagine that your workplace is somewhere that you love showing up every single day. But recently you found yourself trying to come up with every single excuse as to why you don't want to go to work mm -hmm. or you're oversleeping like the clock. You feel exhausted all the time. You are in like a completely negative mood mm -hmm. when it comes to a conversation around work. Those are like my tall tale signs that maybe there's something up. Um, and then there's something going on with the work situation that's kind of subconsciously like telling you like, oh, I don't want to be there. I don't really want to do that anymore. So you start doing small little things like showing up late, um, calling off sick a lot, things like that. That would be a sign of burnout. Yeah, those are things very like similarly associated with depression too, right? Like losing that joy from things and just kind of sleeping in a lot, like yeah. being like a low mood. That's pretty interesting. So can, uh, can burnout lead to depression? Of course, a lot of things can lead to depression, but if, if you're under a constant state of you're giving out too much and you don't have enough energy for yourself, um, definitely can lead to depression because nobody wants to live a lifestyle like that where you're constantly exuding so much energy, but you have nothing left for yourself. There's nothing like 
about you or fun for you to, you know, look forward to, which is work, 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 Mm -hmm. which sure it's rewarding. And I'm not saying that, you know, all the people out there who are putting in extra hours during this tough time are not doing a great service for humanity, but also they need to really be in tune with themselves. And I I like how you say that because the way I see things sometimes too, is like you wake up with this battery charge that you have and wherever you put your energy is where you get consumed, correct? So people are way too focused on these tasks that are, you know, causing them to feel negative. Mm-hmm. So my question to you is, with everything about self-care, I'm trying to word this properly here. Mm-hmm. So with lockdowns that came in and let's just say depression, suicide is on the rise and everything, right? We, we said that maybe at first it's not because people feel whole. I feel like the exact opposite during this lockdown. How has self-care and burnout changed with like lockdown? So with self-care, now you really need to have a reason to like leave the house because mm-hmm. COVID, you're not supposed to be leaving. Um, I think a lot of people stop doing things for themselves because they realize that they're putting other people at risk if, you know, they go get a pedicure or if they go get a massage. But you got to really weigh the risks here. Are you going to be stuck inside your house for the next, I don't know, 48 hours and you don't see daylight? Or are you going to go on a 10 minute walk to help improve your mental and physical health? Um, It... I don't want to be in a stance where I'm promoting like flouting. Yeah. Like, you know, disregarding rules and what's going on right now. But I definitely think that there is a safe and it's a well warranted reason to go out and do things for yourself and be a little bit selfish and take care of your own needs. Because if you don't, then who knows if you're going to be left here. Yeah. I think like we have to like realize, I feel like this whole lockdown, everything that happened, we took away for the individual it's all about okay it's about other people do this for other people like hey we need to look at ourselves too if i want to go exercise and maybe not be at home so much and vitamin d is healthy for me i should kind of have my own little right to do that but yeah that's all kind of taken away from us and this is like the issue that we're experiencing right now with like everything yeah yeah since since you've been doing like clinical psychology for a while i'm curious um if like your patient population has changed over these, these past few months like are you seeing a prevalence prevalence of like a different mental issue than, you, than you've seen prior to, to the COVID lockdowns? So in terms of like, are we seeing different diagnoses? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. but we are seeing higher levels of acuity. So the people that do end up under my level of care, which is in a hospital setting, um, these are people who, you know, they're on the brink of death, basically. Like mm-hmm. they're on, on the edge between suicide and the decision to keep living their life no matter how much pain they're experiencing but we're seeing higher levels of acuity all around so people who would be in like the ed right now for a mental health crisis they could have been there months ago but because Mm -hmm. of covid things are kind of just being pushed down and bottled in and stuff like that and we don't see patients until it's really really late or like they should have been here two months ago kind of thing um, because of the fear of going somewhere, con- contracting some disease or there's not many openings because of social distancing things like you can't have as many people on a program or um, many people are being seen virtually, which is not good for certain people. I was going to say, what's your experience with that? Like seeing like, th- you know, therapists, seeing patients virtually and trying to prescribe them things and it's a conversation that really doesn't have that same emotional feel as Mm -hmm. being in person well i as like a starting person who's practicing in the field i worry like i worry about seeing patients over zoom or patients Mm -hmm. through a video call because you're missing a lot of that body language and you're missing a lot of like the mannerisms so if you're seeing someone with anxiety maybe you're not seeing the foot tapping you know the hand ringing Mm -hmm. or whatever it is that they're doing and it's so hard to see if someone's like in a stupor or if they're very like turned in you can't see that stuff and maybe if you've been in the field for years you can have that gut feeling like this person's fine 
fine or this person's not fine. But me as someone starting off, I really don't like to see people mm-hmm. virtually yeah. because I'm, I'm scared of like the liability and the risk. And I know that not a lot of people have that option to see people in person. But as with the experience I have right now, I feel way more confident seeing them in person. Yeah. Have, has, have you ever done like a virtual appointment with your doctor? No, I have not. So I had to do a virtual with my doctor uh, when I had my accident because like they didn't really know like that my surgery was so intense because I had my surgery done somewhere else and all the paperwork didn't transfer over. I was supposed to bring it. So my first plan with my doctor was was through like Google some like Google Hangouts or whatever. And yeah, That's and cool. like he asked me how how I felt. Is there anything he could do for me? And like, but he couldn't examine or anything. So I feel like you could like Alex said, like you're not seeing all the cues you can get out of the way with, with a lot of things, mm-hmm. especially the, the like the patient that don't really want to seek the care, but they're forced to seek yeah. care. Yeah. They kind of um, like put it under the rug. And then of course my doctor had a, you know, had me in clinic because he had examined me physically. Mm-hmm. But for more people that like didn't have any kind of like experience like this or have any kind of serious symptoms, they just do it virtually and they give them like prescriptions, like no big deal. And I'm also going to say like, you are very self aware. You're able to say, hey, I have pain here. This is happening. And you could describe it very well. You're a nurse. A lot of people aren't self-aware to be like, okay, well, I felt like this today. This made me feel this way. So if, if they're already not aware, how can you diagnose them with not even being face-to-face? Right. Yeah. And like moving forward with, you know, this is a new year, but the virus and everything happening, the pandemic, it's still a real thing. What, what are the, like, the long-term consequences that we could see from like a mental health standpoint? One year, two line, two years, maybe three lines down the road. Because there's going to be some long-term repercussions from a lockdown. Right. And I know that we talked about last time just seeing how the children will bounce back from this. And sure, people are able to adapt. But um, what I've been seeing a lot is a lot more kids in higher levels of care. Like, for example, um, in the suburbs of Chicago, in the hospital network that I am in, we have more patients and children between like ages 10 So as young as 10 up until, you know, 18, we have more of that age group coming into the hospital because of suicide attempts than we do anything else. So So COVID, flu, accidents, broken legs, any of that, that just disappears. It falls away compared to the levels of suicidality that we're seeing. And we're seeing that because these kids are isolated they are away from anything that makes them feel like kids so like going to the park or hanging out with friends going to the mall to hang out with you know whoever they don't get to go into high school and experiment with their identity and you know have like the scene phase or whatever it is that they're all of that is being taken away from them and they're not getting to experience what it it means to be a kid right now. Everything's over Zoom. So not only are you on your computer for seven hours to do class, then the only way that you can hang out with your friends is on Zoom. Your parents are kind of on your back, like, why are you always on your computer? It's a very fine line that these kids have to um, walk right now. And I mean, I can't imagine if I was their age because I wouldn't be handling it the way that they're doing. And imagine when like, schools open back up like what is going to be the system that they're going to implement that's going to work for this are they going to have these kids be six feet apart in classrooms with plexiglass and they can't communicate and they have to still wear a mask because we're doing it too like it's, it's going to be interesting i definitely going to see some like emotional health issues and things like that it might be like smaller class sizes though because a lot of times like especially in college like when you go to like a common class there's like 40, 50 kids in there if you have one professor and I mean that professor teaches that class. Like you have a giant auditorium filled with kids. So maybe we'll take a positive out of this. Maybe we'll do smaller class sizes and this this might benefit you know, kids learning, right? Because it's been proven that smaller class sizes promote better education, right? And we should stuff 30 kids in a room. There's no way a teacher could answer all those questions Definitely. for all 30 students and your class is only like what, 45 minutes to 50 minutes long? Yeah. There's no way she gets to every kid. Maybe you could like make a closer relationship. And then you might see that effect where if it's a close relationship, if the kid's gonna be more open with his teacher, and right? It might help with, with with like self, like a self esteem issues and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. in a perfect world, mm-hmm. I totally agree with everything you're saying, and smaller class sizes are amazing. But I also see that some school districts are not going to have that funding Mm. and they're not going to have the ability to make classroom sizes smaller and to create, you know, to hire another teacher so that there can be three fourth grades or four fourth grades. Um, 
it's gonna be a make it or break it kind of thing um, because things are gonna be cut like gym or art so that we can fund more classrooms for these kids or yeah, it's it might yeah. be good or it might be really, really yeah. bad depending on funding. That's a very good point to look at because funding is everything and we already have issues with that. You know, teacher, teachers were already going on strike. Now imagine yeah. now where we need to have more teachers, smaller classes and all these other financial barriers that are going to come with reopening schools up. Yeah, and regard like the budget thing is, is crazy. Like if you look if you look at like the US economy, it, it's huge. It's trillions and trillions of dollars, right? But when you look at the governmental budget, majority of our tax paying dollars goes to, you know, our military, which is crazy. I think that education is constantly like one tenth of what the actual military budget is, which is complete enough, which is dropping a bucket. Hey man, that, but that, that's why people in China are already learning calculus at the age of ten yeah. and they're here trying to like do word puzzles after like the last 50 minutes of class. Like, yeah, we're really behind on education, man. Right. Yeah, so I have, I also have a question for you regarding like trauma. Have you seen more trauma uh, like with your with your patients? Like, is there more spousal violence going on? Like, is there more like bullying? Is bullying being affected? Anything like that with the trauma sense? So when it comes to trauma, I'm seeing a lot more trauma responses from healthcare workers. Really? Like the effects of, you know, steadily people dying every single day around them. Um, people coming in that you develop a relationship with and then two days later they're intubated and you know that that's a death sentence for some of these people. So a lot of healthcare professionals um, like ambulance drivers, you know, EMTs, people like that. So much trauma response. Um, I know that there is a patient um, that I heard about from a colleague who just from the clapping, you know how back in the pandemic days of March, um, you would clap for all the nurses and the doctors that would be going into shift change at like yeah. six or something like that. So this patient, when she hears the clapping, it's like a trauma response because she's just reminded of when we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what COVID was. And, you know, it was a good gesture, but now she's totally marking that as like a negative event and something well, terrible yeah. that happened. Like negative association, right? I'm also thinking about like, you know, because we're nurses. So just starting my contract in October and I've worked there before, I already see how people are tired and exhausted. And right now there's like the second wave happening, right? Like the hospitals are getting packed back up. And what are we doing instead of giving these nurses a break for self-care? We're offering more bonuses because they're short staff. So now, yeah. now this nurse that's already burnt out is coming into work because they get a thousand dollars if they work three extra shifts within a two three week period yeah so it's well, like there's that motive and we're like emotionally numbing this pain that's there constantly luckily we're in a great hospital where we have enough staff so in like in one shift in icu there's like 20 nurses or something like that right we literally have good patient ratio so far which is amazing we have runners which provide us well usually we have not runners, always. not always but they try to they always plan for staffing and of course we don't get it we don't get it but the ideal situation in our hospital is it's two to one for patients, sometimes one to one when uh, it's appropriate. Then we have runners that help us out when we're in the rooms because we got to gown up and gown off. So we don't want to keep doing that to, to get equipment. And then we have break nurses and we have a charge nurse for support. So we have a very well-structured well, well plan and protocol for this. It's just the staffing is still an issue, which is crazy because staffing was an issue before the pandemic. There was units and hospitals that were suffering because they didn't have enough staffing and people kept leaving because of the staffing issues. Yep. And imagine how bad those hospitals are doing right now, how bad they're sinking. So my question for you, Alex, is like, what ways do you think nurses could promote self-care and prevent like burnout basically back to the, the first topic? So I like to think of it as if you aren't fully there for yourself, you're going to be even more prone to making mistakes, mm -hmm. to getting sick, which you don't want to get sick as a nurse, to, um, you know, just uh, being forgetful, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you don't, don't draw the line, if you don't have that boundary that I'm only working 40 hours this week, no matter how good the money is, mm -hmm. the money's not going to replace how you feel and how rested you are and how satisfied you are with your life. No thousand dollars is gonna change that for anyone. It might temporarily make you happy or it might raise some kind of financial burden off your back, but it's temporary. And you know what's not temporary? A medical mistake. True, yeah, the med air, which 
which is a podcast we probably didn't even do about, but it's huge in the hospital. And I actually wonder what are going to be the statistics of 2020 with medical errors. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be probably the same or even less because if you think about it, uh, COVID is so rampant that even our charting isn't looked at as closely unless like a super emergent or super like a giant error happens. Sometimes we looked at closely because back when in Chicago, nurses were charting my new things because you're in and out of the room so much and there was so much going on where you just chart the basics and that's all we really needed, needed because we weren't sure how COVID progresses, what's gonna happen with it. So just do your baseline photos, do like your assessments and that's all we really expect of you because no one's gonna go back and look at that. They're, they're yeah. really not unless like a giant issue happens like, like I said before. It's definitely getting rough. Like sometimes like, let's just say one year compared to this year, like I used to care and be very meticulous about my charting. Now, I don't want to even look back at the end of my shift if I miss anything. Mm -hmm. I'm just clocking out because I'm mentally just checking out throughout my shift. Yeah. Like the workload has definitely increased. I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't know the percentages, but just gowning on and off for two patients back and forth is enough for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're in the rooms per patient at least four to six times a shift minimum. And imagine if you come out the room and you forget to turn your tube feet on. You hear that beeping, right? Or you forget to turn the call light off. You gotta go back. Like it's not like it takes a toll on you. It's, it's Seems so small putting on a mask and putting on putting on gown and gloves, but if you're doing doing that like twelve times a day, the thing where it just wears on you. Yeah, and and then you know how like we have um, alarm fatigue, Alex. Well, sometimes we have fatigue from other things. For example, you have a patient that like um, the worst thing. Like I have PTSD from this. I swear. You know, so there's sometimes trach patients and they can't talk. They can't say, "Hey, I need I need something." So when they see walk past the room, they knock. And it's like this, it's like this knock because it's like sometimes not polite mm -hmm. and you're, oh, you're busy doing something. And then while you're in like a flight of emotions and thoughts, you have this knock in the background and it literally like makes me go crazy sometimes when I hear it. And they could have pushed the call light, like they, they could touch the call, it's just they refuse it yeah. because they get a better response when they knock because that aggravates you so much, you really want to go in there quick and right away. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's not the right way to do things because if, because yeah, they get your attention quicker but you're already upset going at, in that room. Like, you know, it sounds kind of shitty, but we try to answer colleagues at appropriate times or like as soon as we can. We don't yeah. just sit there and let it ring. You know, right, we, right. we answer at appropriate times, whoever's out there that's been a patient before. Like, it's very rude and annoying to do that. Like, yeah, we'll come in there quicker, but our mindset is going to be a little bit different than when we come after you press the colleague. Like, people don't understand that either. Yeah. I wonder if we asked you this question before, but so basically this fatigue that we're experiencing, we kind of laugh about it at work that it's called like compassion fatigue. So basically after like three, four years of nursing, let's just say, that feeling you had when you were once a nurse or as a new grad nurse, it disappears. Does, does it disappear, do you think, from like the workload because you don't like nursing anymore? Or is it just that emotional numbness that maybe we're just burnt out, tired nurses and that's our coping mechanism? So I think that compassion fatigue is your body's way of coping with, mm -hmm. um, how much stress and how much pain and suffering that your body has to go through and like experience because you know that emotions they're not just emotional you feel them physically so compassion fatigue is just a way of your body protecting itself from experiencing some of this negative stuff just just to keep you on your feet and to keep you going it's uh it's a mechanism to make sure that you don't completely like crumble in on yourself how does that all start right so it first stems mentally correct from a thought and how does that like carry over if you know a way of explaining it for people so when you're going through like stress where you're experiencing this constant like battle at work you start to develop like an attitude towards not like an attitude but like literally a set of beliefs about your situation and then you're going to have those beliefs which are going to work on creating like automatic thoughts and judgments about that situation. So as soon as you have those automatic thoughts and judgments, they're going to affect kind of how you feel and you respond to that situation. Mm, okay. And those feelings, you feel them more from a physiological level, right? So you are, it's like kind of like a sense of like being revolted by something okay. because you're like, oh my God, I have another patient, what? And like, I'm kind of starting to feel like that too. And I've only been doing this for four months or so. But mm -hmm. when I get a new patient and I know that they are just stepping down because they tried to kill themselves like two weeks ago, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, another patient, it's going to be a risk. They're going to need to be assessed daily. Like I can't handle this. And it's every single patient because every single 
patient that you're seeing is just you know a fire just mm-hmm. waiting to be put out and you can't you can't run like that forever like you can't work like that because it takes so much toll on you that's why nurses um it's suggested that like they cycle through you know like different wards different floors work on different units um because it keeps you sane yes but it also you know you keep learning so you still love the field and you're still getting new stuff and it's like a rewarding kind of experience with all the stress like how do you like love yourself in a way how do you like accept those bad emotions and how do you like is there a good way to cope with them because you know that you can't be positive 100% of the time. Right. But you shouldn't need to be positive 100% yes. of the time because that's not healthy. Yes. You have to um, feel ev- right. negativity. You well. have to feel everything. So you got to let yourself feel. And, you know, if it if for a nurse sits 10 minutes at the end of her shift just writing down how she feels about every single thing that she's experienced that day, that's a positive way of letting that out. Um, that's a healthy way of coping with all the emotions and all the experiences. But you you got to let yourself feel those feelings. Feelings are real. They're there. And you got to let them out because it's okay to feel and you don't have to be happy 24 seven. If you didn't feel, you know, sadness, you wouldn't appreciate happiness. Mm-hmm. So do you have like, do you have like a mental mantra that you say, because some nurses just say, Oh, I'm going to drink a bottle. I'm going to have two glasses of wine, three glasses of wine. Oh, I'll finish a bottle. Right. So that's a probably a negative way of coping. Right. Cause you're, yeah. you're, what are you numbing that emotion down instead of like feeling through it? Right. Right. You're, if you're just promising yourself a drink at the end of this, the, what what is your life up to that drink mean you know like are you not experiencing anything is your whole life on pause because you're just waiting to get the times clicking until you get to that drink you can't live your life like that um that's like if you're going to disney in a week from now on and you're gonna put your whole life on pause just because Mm -hmm. disney is coming up you gotta let yourself feel everything up to that point and you know just deal with what's coming towards you you can't block it out or mute it it doesn't work like that so it's on top of emotions and i read some stats uh, with matt a while back that showing that drug overdoses are on a rise and a lot of times you know when you have negative emotions related to like burnout depression you try to cope with those in a negative way with being reinforced with drugs right so have you personally seen like an increase in in drug use i'm sure you're not going to see any overdoses because you don't work in, in the er but have you seen people that are seeking drugs more or that kind of have issues with drugs more often than before? Yeah, so yeah. we're seeing a lot of um, teenagers, like adolescents, um, like drug-induced psychosis um, coming in for a lot of, you know, 12, 13-year-olds who are smoking like two blunts a day. Jeez. Um, you know, when I was 13, I had no idea what that was or <laughs> what was going on, but we see a lot, like an increase in the acuity and the level of use. Mm-hmm. Um, for adolescents, for young adults, we see a lot more alcoholism and drinking. That two two glasses of wine turned into like a bottle a night kind of thing. Or I can't have dinner. I can't go get brunch. I can't do anything unless there's alcohol involved. We're seeing a lot more of that. And I know I have seen the stats about the overdoses and the drug drug use is on the rise, but I'm not sure as to what like the main contributing factors are. Obviously, I know isolation Mm -hmm. and when you do drugs or if you consume alcohol, it's kind of like a thing to bring people together. So it does provide you with that like um, social aspect of it. But I also think that um, because of COVID, you know, it could be that your drug dealer is not around anymore. So you have a new drug dealer and, you know, a new product and that's why you have an overdose. There's a lot. There's a lot to it. And we're just seeing right now these spikes. So I'm just interested to see, like, when does it Mm -hmm. level out? Um, Is it because of that second wave that's been kind of talked about for so long um and what's going to happen this year and just just seeing what the stats are going to show us and that's the beauty of science right that like i it's so funny how there's like people out right now that are like yeah this works that works this was bad this was ineffective like it's silly because they're arguing points based on their rational opinion it's like things might change next year all this 2020 literature is going to come out and we'll be like wow guys lockdown was a bunch of bs it did not work you know what I'm saying? So we just have to be very mindful of that. Yeah. I'm glad you talk about isolation. Have you like studied like anything deep with like isolation? Because, you know, 
I mean, I don't want to dive into conspiracy theory or anything <laughs> like that. Let's do it. But if, like, you know, you put somebody in long-term isolation or you isolate them from their, their friends or you make them feel isolated, that has a detrimental effect on, on their brain. And you could literally brainwash people with that kind of with that kind of stuff, right? So how do you help somebody deal with, like, isolation? Well, a lot of the people that are isolating are actually, you know, people who at once were really social. Mm. Um, they were out- outgoing. They were outside of the house for the majority of their waking hours. Um, and, you know, if they're depressed or if they're dealing with some s- social anxiety, situational anxiety, um, you just you got to come up with what works for them and what's going to help them get out of the house, get out of the yeah. bed. You know, what is in their means to do right now to get them out of that isolation bubble mm-hmm. and get them to spend time with their friends, with their parents. Um, I know that sometimes people can live in the same house, but they never even step outside of their bedroom mm-hmm. because they're isolating and they're pushing people away from them. You know, they're not responding to texts, to messages. And that's happening a lot. Major depressive disorder is like really on the rise right now. And mm-hmm. I'm nobody's surprised by that, but um, it happens a lot. And it's important that if you do have those friends or those people in your mm-hmm. lives that are kind of ignoring your texts or they're um, trying to come up with every single possible excuse as to why they can't hang out with you, even though they did like a couple weeks yeah. ago or maybe a month ago, um, to check in on those people. Because if it's not like in your norm to be isolative or to push yourself away, that might be a warning sign of something. Especially like humans, right? We need human connection, right? Like can we could go crazy and die if we're freaking isolated. Yeah. Like for that movie, I forgot with Tom Hanks. Like, he needed an emotional connection with somebody so bad, he he drew, like, a smile on a freaking ball. And that Mm -hmm. meant something to him because it was some kind of resemblance, right, of a human. Mm -hmm. That's that's wild to me. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, Yeah, but, I mean, as human beings, you seek connection. Yes. You seek that interaction. Even as a young baby, you know, your first thing that you do is cry for your mom. You don't see someone, even as a baby, you don't know that you're alone, but if you don't see your mom, you start crying. Mm -hmm. That's just a response that you're, you're a human. You need that interaction. You need that safety and security of having somebody else there. Um, and without that, you know, the brain kind of does start playing tricks on you or you feel so isolated. You're not stimulated in any way Mm -hmm. by another person Mm -hmm. so it's it's not a fun it's not a fun feeling to experience this is just going to be pure opinion but if you're if you have the ability to change anything with mental health and everything that you see where would you like mental health to go in the next few years and and i want i want to add one thing that Mm -hmm. i do see positive change with the acceptance of um like lsd and psilocybin and now (laughs) we're doing tests like that from you know mental health this um uh, major depressive disorders and everything else and depression. So what's, what's your stand on all that? So my thing would be funding mm-hmm. to have more um, psychotherapists, counselors, um, you know, anyone in the mental health field, whether it's like a social worker, um, more people like that working in the school system, working in the police departments, just any single situation that can arise where you need somebody to talk to, you have somebody available for you, whether it's, you know, in college, in high school, elementary school, whether it's a a Catholic school, like you need somebody to talk to. We have more than enough qualified people who are in the field. Um, They're ready to do the best kind of work possible. We just need more acceptance of their role and how much they are needed. Because I know that right now, a certain city in Illinois is piloting a program to have, um, counselors being like on task with the police department so -hmm. anytime that there is like a domestic violence or some kind of abuse call that counselor goes out with the sheriff or with the police officer and they respond to that scene because that counselor can either talk to the sheriff um, and you know diffuse the situation or whatnot or they can provide counseling right there on the spot for whoever's involved in the call and I think that should be happening for 
everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying get rid of the police department. I'm saying that we pair, um, you know, these mental health workers with the appropriate um, departments because they're necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of situations could be avoided or a lot more good work can be done if we have these people working in the right place. I love how you brought that up because, you know, a police officer could have a benefit, you know, to de-escalate de the situation with, with what's happening at that point of time. I also wish maybe if we had one in the hospital. There's so many times that I go and have a conversation with my patient. Yeah. And, you know, their heart rate's up or something. Or their blood pressure. And I talk to them. They're like, yeah, my insurance is about to expire in three days. I don't know if I should, ex you know, extend it. And <laughs> that guy, that guy gets, gets intubated the next day. Mm -hmm. Or I have a patient that's like 60 days on ECMO. And I can tell in her face that something's wrong. And I ask her if she's in pain. She's not. But she's just feeling lonely and she just doesn't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're busy as nurses. Yeah. I, I wish I had time to hold her hand and ask her what could make that better. Or let's talk about a different story and change this. But we don't have that damn time. And that's so sad because sometimes we just treat these patients like it's like a mechanic. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey... We're here to fix this. Okay, pressure is low. We do this. We give this medicine for that. And we treat them that way. But that human aspect is sometimes lost, especially with COVID now. Yeah. And it's ICU, like dude. they're looking in the fishbowl. It's crazy. Yeah, like in ICU, there is really no time for us to actually like talk to these patients or figure out what is going on mentally. Because like ICU is, is literally like the most acute care setting you could be besides ER, right? So once they're able to talk and basically function, we send them out, right? So we missed that we are missing a giant piece of, of holistic nursing in the ICU. Yeah. Because like you said, we focus on the problem and fixing it and then moving them out. So we're missing that giant mental health portion. I'm not sure how it is on med surge or like units where you where people are walkie talkie, but in the ICU, we're definitely missing that giant, giant chunk. But um, before you wrap this up, I had a question for you. Okay. A little, a little bit different than we're talking about, but more personal, I guess. I always wanted to ask you this and I don't know why I have it before, but who is like your favorite psychologist or do you have a favorite psychologist? Um, so I really enjoy the works of Yalom, mm -hmm. um, but so does every single millennial therapist out there. Okay. Um, I think that every single person that I've read about, you know, whether it's Freud, um, they're all necessary. Um, but I don't know. I like Beck. Beck because I do enjoy CBT and a lot of like the thoughts, the behaviors, the actions, the reactions kind of thing. CBT? Um, I could explain cognitive <laughs> behavioral therapy. Oh, oh CBT. Yes, oh, CBT. I thought, oh, okay. I thought CBT. I couldn't figure out what CBT was. She she explained it to me before where you take a notebook. If you if you want to self journal this, correct? You you write your thoughts, mm -hmm. your feelings, and your behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a negative feeling, like I smoked a cigarette, right? That was a behavior, and then you, you kind of ask yourself, how'd you feel at that point in time? And so what, you're what, what that problem, so you're trying to figure out where that problem stemmed from, so right? Where that behavior stemmed from. So the overall goal is if you have a pattern, then mm -hmm. you start seeing um, what emotions are creating what sort of negative thoughts, and then you can do some work on schemas. So overall, why do you have this negative thought pattern? Or why do you have this negative thinking process? Like, why do you always associate driving and traffic with a negative thing? Mm -hmm. Is it because somewhere deep down in there, you know, you had some kind of incident or or something happened where then it created this whole thought process and outlook on driving in traffic. So CBT, it's very structured, um, but there is for people who are more logical and people who like seeing patterns mm -hmm. and analyzing things, if you do a correct CBT journal, you can start seeing these things. Mm -hmm. um, it might take a week or two of journaling, but then eventually you do see a pattern if you're being honest. What about the first psychologist? The one that you said that millennial, all millennial people look up oh, to? Like, so, what, is, what kind of work does he have? So Yalom, just a lot of writing about like the gift of therapy or mm -hmm. group work. Um, group counseling is like a big thing for me and for the patients that I work with um, and just seeing the positives that come out of group work and how um, you get a different kind of interaction between people who are experiencing like depression. Mm -hmm. So if you have a group with all 
peers who are experiencing depression, not only are you the therapist helping them to work on themselves, but they're also getting that like group interaction from other people. So um, another person suffering from depression might give this person some kind of tip Mm -hmm. or, you know, provide them with some support, um, provide them with information about what's worked for them. Um, Group work and Yalom, he has a really good book also about group counseling um, but it's like the new trendy thing for millennial therapists. Okay. Um, it's probably because our teachers who probably went to school with Yalom also just his writing, but everybody is, you know, quoting Yalom right now. Yeah, it does have some validity because uh, my Miss Seuss, she, she's a recovering alcoholic. Uh, she's been in recovery. She said I had to drink in eight years. And when she was getting my, my massage, she, all she would talk with, not all, but majority of her conversation was, about her AA meetings yeah. and um, group work. Right. How it's so beneficial because like you said, they offer tips and it's also, it was, for her it was beneficial because she was able to see that somebody can relate to her, that somebody can be in her shoes too yeah. and, and recover or have a path for recovery. So because a lot of times people feel that the emotions they're experiencing are just their emotions and no one else could, could feel them and, they, and no one can help them. Right. Because they can't, they can't figure out a way to have somebody else in their shoes, right? So that's why she praised it was because she's like, oh shit, I'm an alcoholic, and these are all alcoholics. Yeah. And they've been able to recover. I can recover too. Again, they listen to different stories, and they give each other tips, and no one has any kind of judgment. Right, yeah. So It's, al- it's cool. almost like that human mimicking behavior, right? You know how like humans mimic things? Well, they're able to mimic change and stop drinking because that person did it too. So they just have to figure out what are the what things that work for yeah. them as well and yeah. relate to it. And there's also, you know, just altruism so you're in the group and you're getting support and everybody's supporting you because they want you to do well they want you to stop drinking Mm -hmm. um 12 step groups or like the you know narcotics anonymous or Mm -hmm. all these different groups they work on all these principles that yalom outlines about why group work and group um interaction is so beneficial it's so much different to sit in front of a table with a therapist asking you, well, how does that make you feel? Than sitting with 12 other people who are having real human experiences yeah. every single day and they're struggling with urges and they're struggling with triggers, but they're still able to maintain that sobriety. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm not saying that either one is better, but I do like them in conjunction. Okay, yeah, it's cool. It's good to have the option there too because like everybody functions differently. Some of us loved group project, group projects in college and high school some of us hated them yeah you know i personally liked group studying like if you asked me how i passed through nursing school it was having a close tight of friends that we were a group we went flashcards. Mm-hmm. you didn't know anything you filled me in the blank right away and i learned from you so quick i could remember it on the test and sometimes like i go through the test and i just hear somebody's mm-hmm. voice talking and they're answering this question to me and it's very beneficial right or you're stuck on a concept because you're thinking out of you're thinking about it in one way and somebody else comes at it a different way. You're just like, yeah, that makes complete, complete sense, right? And, and then how that works. Yeah. And then also like the stigma with you're just one-on-one, yeah. it makes you feel kind of like sick. Like there's something wrong with me that I have to go see a therapist. Yeah. That like, I'm sure that stigma is still out there. Like, Oh, that. yeah. Yeah. And that's like taught through like school because if you're, if you call the principal's office and suddenly you and a principal, like you know you're in trouble, right? You yeah. did something wrong, right? It's kind of how it feels too. I'm, I'm, I'm sure when you're a recovering addict and you have one of all conversation with somebody, it's like you're in trouble for something. Right. And it's not your fault that you're in disposition. You know, it's just how addictive these substances happen to be, and you just fall in that category where you might have an addictive personality, or you might just have have a way to just latch on these things and not be able to let go. So it's crazy. Any um tips you want to offer for for self care? Oh yeah. Like easy ones that people could kind of implement every day or tips to decrease stress, anxiety? So for Mm self-care, just ask yourself a question every single day. And that's um, what is one good thing that you're going to do for yourself or one thing that you are going to do for yourself that makes you feel good. And if you can't answer that question on a daily basis, that's a problem. Um, You know, it can be as little as taking a long shower or uh, like doing a facial steam or lighting you know a candle smelling some essential oils but if there is not one thing that you do in the whole day to prioritize yourself your well-being um that's definitely a place to start 
uh, scheduling, scheduling, you know, maybe 10 to 30 minutes for something that you're going to do that makes you feel good, whether it's a walk, a massage, or going to the gym. All these things have such a big impact if they're done regularly and you really do take care of yourselves. Um, but if you don't, you start to see that burnout and that negative feeling towards something that used to make you so happy. Yep. Amazing, Alex. Thank that's, you so much. that's the biggest takeaway. Huh? <laughs> One thing that you want to do for yourself that you know that you feel loved if you do it, right? Yeah. yeah. That's the biggest takeaway. Self-love. Yeah, you yeah. heard it here, guys. Love yourself. <laughs> Fleur, you. huh? Fleur. Fleur life. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for being here. Your second time here. We love when you hop on here. You have so much good opinions, good thoughts, and good things to say. Hopefully, we could have you here for a third, fourth, and a fifth time. Oh, thank you. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you guys for listening. We will continue having guests. We kind of slacked out for a little bit of time, but you got to take a step back once, two steps forward. <laughs> Ciao, guys. See you guys next week. See you guys. Bye. Peace out.